Earlier in this series, I mentioned how the irrationality of square root of two gave Pythagoras and his fellow thinkers some real problems. Well, they had similar issues with infinity. If the world was the work of the gods and therefore a perfect creation, shouldn't everything be explainable with perfection? The perfection that is whole numbers? Surely the gods wouldn't leave any messy, incomplete numbers lying around in this perfect universe? And when it came to ugly, the idea of something so large no number could describe it was every bit as unpleasant as the square root of two. As such, discussions of infinity often got caught up in the overlap between human thought and the divine. St. Augustine famously asked, such as say that things infinite are past God's knowledge, may just as well leap headlong into this pit of impiety and say that God knows not all numbers. What madman would say so? What are we, mean wretches that dare presume to limit his knowledge? Oh, Augie, chill out now. Over the centuries, and with some help from great mathematical minds like Galileo, we arrived at an understanding of infinity. But you only have to listen to children arguing whether my dad who can lift up infinity plus infinity is stronger than your dad who can lift infinity times infinity to see that she can be a slippery concept. I think the best way to cut through this confusion is this observation. Many people think of infinity as though it is a number, a really big, like really, really big number, but a number nonetheless. Well, it's from this assumption that a lot of the confusion around infinity arises. I suggest think of infinity not as a number or the description of a type of number. No, no, think of infinity as describing a type of measurement. In fact, a word is describing something so large it can't be measured by a number. Think, for example, of the word many. If there are many people watching the football and another 10 turn up, no one would say there are now many plus 10 people at the football. There are still many people in the crowd. Well, in the same way the child who counters their mother's statement of infinite love with, well, I love you infinity plus 100, they're not really making mathematical sense. In fact, whether there is such a thing as infinite love is a deep philosophical question in itself. Probably one more suited to Peter Singer than me, and I strongly recommend his videos to you. Anyway, here are a couple of fascinating and famous mathematical observations that might help you appreciate one of the deepest and most beautiful concepts in the world of maths, that of infinity. David Hilbert was one of the giants of 20th century mathematics. Many of the concepts with which he wrestled were exhaustingly deep, well beyond the understanding of mere mortals such as ourselves. But in a 1924 lecture, he introduced a thought experiment that he hoped would help people in their picturing of infinitely large sets. The lecture was called Uber Dash Unendlich, which translates as about the infinite. Imagine you're running a hotel, not just a normal hotel, not just a large hotel, not just a really large hotel. Imagine you're running an infinitely large hotel. You manage a hotel with an infinity of single bedrooms stretching off down a corridor. It's the high season, so your infinitely large hotel is full. And one more person turns up and really needs a room to stay in. You don't want to throw out anyone you've already got in the hotel, so what room do you put this new person in? Well, they can't go into the final room of the hotel because there isn't a final room. They can't go into room seven because there's someone in room seven and they'd have nowhere to move to. So pause the video and have a good think about this. How can you accommodate this new guest and the infinity of guests you already have. Here's what you do. You send out an email to the infinite number of hotel rooms asking everyone at 9 a.m. prompt to leave their room and move to the room next door. The person in room one moves to room two, the person in room two moves to room three and so on. And your new guest takes room one. Your infinite hotel is still full and you can go back to watching YouTube or TikTok or whatever takes your fancy. But no sooner have you finished cleaning up after serving another infinitely large lunch when up the driveway comes an infinitely large bus. Yes, an infinitely large tour group are now in the foyer of the Infinite Hotel and they'd all like a room. But you can't just ask everyone who has a room to shuffle along an infinite number of rooms. I mean, how far would the guest in room one currently have to move? No, that won't work. So again, pause the video and ask yourself, what would you do? Hilbert's ingenious idea was this, send out an email to the infinity of guests currently in the hotel saying, at 5 p.m., please come out of your room and move to the room number that is double yours. So the person in room one would move to room two, the person in room two would move to room four, 
The person in room 100 would move to room 200, which is a bit of a hike, but not as bad for the person in room 1 million who walks another million rooms up the hall and tucks into bed. This now means that all the even rooms are full, leaving all the odd rooms, an infinite number of them for the infinite number of new guests. You wake up in the morning pretty happy with yourself and you won't believe what happens next. Up the driveway comes not one infinitely large bus, not two infinitely large buses. No, it's barely sunrise and an infinity of infinitely large buses are coming up the road. How can you, in your infinite hotel, which was already completely full, accommodate an infinity of infinitely large buses? I don't mean to patronise you, but instead of thinking time for this one, I might just plough straight ahead. There are a number of ways to handle this, and here is one. The infinite buses arrive in some given order, B1, B2, B3, and so on. And everyone has an individual seat in the infinity of seats on each bus. Seat 1, S1, S2, S3, and so on. Then every new arrival can be uniquely identified by a pair of numbers B, S. If you want the seat 8 on the fifth bus, you are guest 5, 8, and no one else is. And all the people who were already in the infinite hotel when the new guests arrive can be uniquely identified by the pair 0, S, signifying their current room number S and the fact they were already there, so they were effectively on bus number zero. Well, now it's easy. For the infinity of current guests and the infinite number of guests on the infinitely large buses, every guest is now uniquely identified by a pair of whole numbers B, S. And as a manager, you simply assign the guest B, S to the room two to the power of B multiplied by three to the power of S. So the person who was already in room four in the hotel who we think of as 0,4 moves to the room 2 to the power of 0 times 3 to the power of 4. Now, 2 to the power of 0 is 1. You might have to trust me on that or ask any 13-year-old you know who loves their maths. And 3 to the power of 4 is 81. So person 0,4 moves from room 4 to room 81. Our newly arrived guest 5,8 who we spoke about earlier, they can kick back and order some room service to room 2 to the power of 5 times 3 to the power of 8 which is 32 times 6,561, or room 209,952. Now, if that doesn't hurt your head quite enough, get this. Once the infinity of buses have arrived, each depositing their infinity of guests in addition to the infinity of guests who were already there, your infinite hotel, which started with every room full, now has some rooms empty. By thinking about all the numbers that can be written in the form 2 to the power of B times 3 to the power of S, we see that the first room in our infinite hotel to be filled would be when the guest originally in room one moves to room three. Hate to interrupt. Would you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by comedian, broadcaster, and mathematician Adam Spencer, completely ad-free. The next room to be filled would be by the person in seat one on bus number one. This guest, call her 1, 1, goes to room 2 to the power of 1 times 3 to the power of 6. Then the guest originally in room 2 of the hotel will find themselves now in room 9. The new guest on bus 2, seat 1, goes to room 12. Just when you as manager might be thinking, OK, every multiple of 3 gets filled. You see the second guest off bus 1, the guest we've labelled as 1, 2, go to room 18, followed by the first guest off bus 3, guest 3, 1, who goes to room 24. Then more and more of the infinity of guests stream in and you probably have other things to think about. But rooms 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10 and 11 are now all empty. As are rooms 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23. In fact, and this may be a bit of a head spin when you first think about it, if you were to walk any finite distance down the infinitely long corridor of this hotel, the vast majority of rooms you passed would be empty. Even though that day you added an infinite number of infinite busloads of passengers to your already full infinite hotel. That is all part of the fun of managing Hilbert's infinite hotel. And if that really hurts, you might want to take a breather before we tackle our next little infinity insight. Some infinities are bigger than others.
Imagine you had 10 cards on a table in front of you with the counting numbers one through to 10 written on each card. And I have the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 on cards on a table in front of me. If I ask you who has the most numbers, the answer should be clear, you do. It's not a trick question, you have 10. I only have five. Let's say you have the numbers one to a thousand on cards and I have all the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, dot, 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 up to a thousand. Same question, who has the most numbers? Same answer, you have a thousand, twice as many as me. Let's say you have all the counting numbers up to one billion on cards on an admittedly very big table in front of you. I have all the even numbers, two, four, six, up to a billion. Again, you should be able to see that you have more numbers than me. You've got all of my numbers and as many more again, the odd numbers. But what if you had the infinity of all counting numbers on your table and I had all the even counting numbers? Now who has the most numbers? Pause this video and ask yourself, do you still have twice as many numbers as me? There's two ways to think about this and they lead to different answers, only one of them is correct. Perhaps you're thinking, well, I've got every one of Adam's numbers and I've got all the odd numbers as well. So my group of numbers is bigger, but this way of thinking breaks down once the set of numbers we have become infinite. In fact, the set of numbers we each have are the same size. I can show you this fact by thinking this way. I want you to take a number off your desk and hold it up. There you go, you've picked number three. Well, I'm gonna double that in my head and I'll respond with card number six. Let's do it again. If you pick up nine, I'll double nine, I'll reply with 18. Again, five would get 10, 101 would get 202 and so on. Do you see that if for every number you pick, I reply with its double, I can match up our two sets of numbers in a perfect one to one correspondence. Every one of your numbers can be paired with its double from my pile in a way that there's exactly one match in my pile for each and every number of your pile of all the counting numbers. Well, in the late 19th century, the great German mathematician, Georg Cantor, used this logic to show that while these two sets, the counting numbers and the even numbers are both infinite, they are also of the same size, a size we call countably infinite. Now you might think, well, obviously, if they're both infinite, they're the same size because infinity is like infinity, isn't it? Well, it turns out, no, this is not the case. Some infinities are bigger than others. There are uncountably infinite sets. Don't panic, we'll creep up on this slowly. What if I had all the odd numbers on my table? Again, this is an infinite set of numbers. Are they the same size of infinity as the counting numbers and the even numbers? You should be able to see that they are. Here's a one-to-one -one correspondence that would work. For every number you take off your table, I'll double it, generating an even number, and I'll subtract one, now giving me an odd number. So let's look at the first few examples. You show me one, I double it to two, subtract one, I get one. Your card one matches my card one. Your card two doubles to four, subtract one, get three. So your card two matches with my card three. Three doubles to six, subtract one, you get five. Your card three matches my card five, and so on. Can you see that the infinitely large set of odd numbers is the same size? It's in one-to-one -one correspondence with that of the even numbers and of the counting numbers. Okay, so far, so good. What about all the whole numbers? What we mathematical types call the integers. What if we include the negatives of the counting numbers? Does that double the size of the infinity or does it stay the same? Well, if you just list the numbers in this order, zero, one minus one, two minus two, three minus three and so on, we should see that we have a list here that will get to every integer in an orderly, countable fashion. Those infinities are all the same size. What about the set of all fractions? Well, at first it seems a lot harder to work out how to order the fractions in a way that we can match them up with the counting numbers. If you go a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, etc., well that list goes on forever and we'd never even get to two thirds. Or 2,343 on seven, let alone 73 on 28,545 and so on. But in 1873, Cantor came up with this beautiful observation. For any fraction, add together its top number and its bottom number, which we call the numerator and the denominator, and group the fraction with all the others whose numerator and denominator add to the same. Huh? Think about two thirds. Two plus three is five, but one plus four is five, and so is three plus two and four plus one. So think of the fractions two thirds and one quarter and three over two and four over one as all being together. Similarly, the fractions 
whose denominators and numerators add to give us seven. Our six over one, five over two, four over three, three over four, two over five, and one over six. Now for every fraction there is, you can add together the numerator and denominator and get an exact value. Each fraction gives you one and only one such value. So Cantor's genius was to realize you could order the fractions like this. You get an ordered list that can be lined up in perfect one-on-one -on -one correspondence with the counting numbers. One matches up with one over one, two matches up with two over one, three matches up with one over two, four matches up with one over three, and so on. The counting numbers are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the fractions. The fractions are countably infinite. But what about when we allow numbers that can't be written as fractions? When we consider the set of numbers that includes numbers like pi, remember that its decimal expansion begins 3.141592, but keeps going forever. These numbers, we call them the irrational numbers, not because they act in a way that can't be trusted or they make poor decisions. No, no, no. Irrational in this sense means not as a ratio or not as a fraction. The set of rational and irrational numbers is called the real numbers. Well, in 1873, Cantor again showed brilliantly, you cannot create a one-to-one -one correspondence between the counting numbers and the positive real numbers. Here's why. Let's say you could produce a list of all the real numbers in a countable order. Well, I ask you to write down that list with each number in its full decimal expansion. For rational numbers like five over two, when the decimal expansion ends, just keep writing lots of zeros behind it, please. So five over two would be 2.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. Well, I can produce a number that is not on your alleged list of all the reals. Let's say your list began with the following numbers, and so on. Well, I'm gonna create a new number. My new number begins with a zero and a decimal point. Then by looking at your first number and its first decimal place, in this case, five, I'm gonna add one to that and make the first decimal place of my new number six. Moving on to the second number, its second decimal place is a three. I'll add one to that, get four, and make the second decimal place of my new number, which now reads 0 0.64. Looking at the third place of the decimal expansion of the third number, I see a zero. I'm gonna add a one to that, get one. My new number now begins 0 0.641. And I'm gonna keep going down your list of all the real numbers, making sure the next number and my new number are different each time in that next decimal place. You should be able to see that my new number is clearly different to the first number on your list. It's different in the first decimal place. But by comparing second decimal places, my new number is also clearly different to the second number on your list and to the third number on your list and so on and so on. In fact, my new number must be different to every number on your list of the reals. So your list was incomplete. Cantor had shown that you cannot order the positive reals in a countable fashion because for every potential list of all the reals, you can create a new number that's not on the list. The positive reals are uncountably infinite, as such represent a larger infinity than the set of counting numbers. If you feel like you could do with an infinitely long nap right now, I do understand, but hopefully you'll never look at infinity the same way again.